Welcome, everyone! Hey! Okay, so tonight we are going to start off the wonderful night with some wonderful games. So... Okay, so the gr game is called Feeling Green, and there will be a series of questions on the board and there will be three options and you have to pick which option you think is the best and you play with the, your partner next to you. Okay. So this is related to this weekend is um, Earth Day. And so these are about like inter um, environment questions and then some also other random green questions. Question number one. Recycling one glass bottle saves enough energy to power a computer for A, 25 minutes, B, 35 minutes, or C, 45 minutes. Talk with your partner about it. The answer is A, 25 minutes. Wow, that's a really long time. Okay, Kermit the Frog's first ever appearance on TV was The Muppet Show, Sesame Street, or Sam and Friends? I know them from The Muppet Show, so. Okay, the answer is Sam and Friends. Oh, question three. On average, which country uses the most paper per year? A, China, B, USA, C, Japan. Also, guys, let's quiet down a little, please. We're kind of loud. The answer is A, China. Question four. Green is most people's second favorite color. What is their first? A, orange, B, blue, or C, red? I think The answer is B, blue. It's one of mine, so. How many more, or how much more efficient are the newer LED light bulbs versus traditional light bulbs? 60 to 70, 70 to 80, or 80 to 90? The answer is 80 to 90. Question six, what instrument was used for the original roar from Godzilla? A, electric guitar, B, stylophone, or C, double bass? The answer is C, double bass. Question seven, which single use item creates the most trash in the USA? A, sandwich and food containers, B, plastic bottles, or C, trash bags? The answer is A, sandwich and food containers. Um, which Guardians of the Galaxy character did not, or did actor Seth Green not voice? Howard the, or Howard the Duck, Groot, or Rocket Raccoon? The answer is Groot. Question nine. What would one ton of recycled cardboard ultimately save? A, five trees, B, 12 trees, or C, 17 trees? Oh, the answer is C, 17 trees. That's a lot of trees. Question 10, what inspired Dr. Seuss's, Dr. Seuss to have the Grinch be colored green? A, an ugly rental car, B, dog vomit, or C, a pickle? The answer is A, an ugly rental car. Okay, so this is gonna be tiebreaker. So whoever wins this 
you get bragging rights. Okay, so the question is, which dollar bill amount has the shortest lifespan before it is unfit to be used anymore? The $1 bill, $10 bill, or $100 bill? The answer is B, the $10 bill. Okay, so that was a really fun game, but we are now gonna move on to some really fun announcements. <laughs> so first we have launch. So this is all for the 12th graders tonight, and it'll be here during your small group time, and you can invite your parents and have them come around 7.30. All right, next we have into the sixth grade night. So if you have any fifth grade friends that you can just invite them to Riverside on May 10th and May 17th because we are gonna have a night where we can invite them to start coming to Riverside students. Okay, next we have the baptism celebration. So it is next weekend, but we would recommend that you sign up by this weekend or else it will get way too crowded and it will be hard for other people to do what they're there to do. Yeah, hope to see you guys there. All right, now we have, um, there are some event cards. So it's just gonna kind of show us all the events coming up and you can get some in the cafe. <laughs> if you don't have it. And last we have squad which is really fun because I'm in it, but it's a way for you to be able to have a voice in student ministry and share your ideas and see them come to life. So if you want to be a part of that, I'd suggest joining. Yes. So with all these wonderful events coming up, we're now gonna look at some wonderful events that happened last week. I invite you to stand and let's welcome our Soccer Rapids people too. All right, is everybody ready to worship? Oh yeah. Woo, me too. We're gonna start out with Graves into Gardens. We're gonna start that. All right, it starts with I Search the World. Ready? I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty place and treasures that fade, but never enough. Then you came along. Then you came along. Put me back together. Every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Let's sing, there's nothing better. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid. 
for worshiping with us. All right, we've got a new song. It's called My Testimony. We sing it on Sundays sometimes, and it just kind of proclaims what God's done in our lives and how amazing it is that we are here and we're allowed to speak God's name and be loud about it. So I encourage you guys, once you catch on, be loud, scream it out. We're gonna scream out how God's changed our life I encourage you guys to yell that out. So we're gonna sing I Saw Satan, ready? I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw his darkness run for cover. 
But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven I believe in signs I believe in signs and wonders Resurrection power the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven My praise belongs to you forever Here's the chorus, ready? This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony, this is my testimony. We're gonna sing, come together. Ready? Come together, sons and daughters. Bottled and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father, our God. We'll finish what he started. Our God will finish what he started. Oh, this is my testimony from death to life. To this grace we wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. This next part sings about how if we're not dead, we're not done. So we're going to shout that out. Ready? If I'm not dead, you're not done. Cause greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Cause greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come, oh, I believe. All right, we're going to shout out. This is my testimony. Let's put our hands together. This is my testimony from dead to life. Because grace we wrote my story. Justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. I just thank you all for being here tonight, and I hope that we can all continue to worship and lift up our praise to God, because we have one more song for you today.
you guys please pray with me? Thank you, God, for bringing us here to this place that we can freely worship you. And I just pray that tonight this message doesn't just sit in our hearts, that we use this to speak about you to others. And maybe that's whoever you're thinking of in your head right now. I just pray that you keep this message on your hearts to bring it to the people who need it. Amen. Hello, everybody. A little, little crew going on here. That's great. Hey, I'm so glad you guys are here. We want to just continue to build off of what we've studied in the previous week. So right now, we're going to be passing out message notes. I encourage you to grab them, write some stuff in. We're going to give you some interactive things to do with the notes tonight. So it would be awesome if you get some. Uh, we're going to play a little opener here, though. I think this relates really well to our message. How many of you have heard of anything in the news lately regarding artificial intelligence? Has anybody heard any news headlines? Like, it's all over, right? It's everything. And you may have even been cautioned from your school on how you use artificial intelligence. So we're going to play a little icebreaker here, uh, science, fact, or fiction. I was reading some different articles recently, and these all sort of relate to our message tonight in kind of a front-end way. Uh, I just compiled them all together. So the instructions are very simple. Is the story about science fact or fiction? You can play with the person next to you if you want to or just follow along. Here's the first one. Elon Musk made tech to put into human brains to link them to computers. Is that fact or fiction? That actually is fact. That's fact. The wires will hook into your brain and they're meant to treat injuries, paralysis, blindness, and more. Here's another one. Chat GPT will help you talk with an AI robot of family members who have died. It gets fact or fiction? It is actually fact. Yeah. So the idea is that if your grandma or grandpa has passed away, uh, you can create a construct of them and ask them for advice on life and like, should I date this person? Should I marry this person? Even though they're dead, it'll take all their information and compile it into a robot that you can ask questions to. All right, here's the next one. A new AI system can tell with accuracy if the date you're on is working out or not. Fact or fiction? This is also fact, actually. It connects to wearable technology. You have to put it in your mouth or up your nose, and basically it'll gauge if each person on the date is doing well or not with the other person. All right, here's another one. Ford has a plan to take over your car if you're late on making a car payment. Fact or fiction? This actually is also fact as well. It'll annoy you with endless notifications, and it'll even lock you out of your car. They actually are programming it to drive your car to an impound if you have not paid your bill. So that's coming up. Here's another one. Scientists have made a robot that can melt itself down and then reform itself again. Fact or fiction? Correct answer is fact. It'll melt its way down. The idea is like it, it can melt its way out of a prison cell. It'll melt its way out and reform itself. It could actually jump 20 times its body size, climb walls, and escape from a mock prison. Science, fact or fiction, a robot is being made that will have its own consciousness to imagine its own future. This is also a fact, actually. The creator made them into spider robots. Let me say that again. The creator made them into spider robots that can evolve and learn so humans can make them do chores and solve our problems. Let's do a couple more. A humanoid-like robot that can do parkour was made to do hard work and chores for people. It is also fact, by the way. Atlas the robot can learn and relearn to evaluate, lift objects, and do sick flips. All right. And here is maybe a couple of the last ones we have here for you. A ro company is creating humanoid AI robots to take over jobs, care for the elderly, and do space exploration. That is also fact. That is also fact. The company is called Figure. 
Uh, they promised to not use them in military roles or anywhere that would involve inflicting harm on humans. Here's the last one. Here's the last one. Tech leaders called for a worldwide halt in future AI development, for if left unchecked, it will be a profound risk to humanity. Fact or fiction? That is fact as well. They were all facts. The growing list includes company founders like the guys who did Apple and Pinterest, doctors, professors, scientists, engineers, and more, including Mr. Elon Musk. Now, the reason I share all of this with you is to ask you another question. How many of you have ever seen the movie WALL-E before? Yes, WALL-E's a great, fun movie. WALL-E also has an interesting message for who we may become in the future. This is WALL-E meeting some humans for the first time. Take a look at this. I have it all morning, so let's hover over, over to the driving range and hit a few virtual balls in space. Now we did that yesterday. I don't want to do that. Well, then what do you want to do? I don't know. Something. Wow. Make a place grief. Oh, it does sound Look, I'm tired of it. If you can't fold the straw, no, no, you have to sign any music. good. Hot. Over here. Whoa. Hello? Hello? Tunnel. I'm in a tunnel. I can't hear you. There you are. By and large, everything you need to be happy. Your day is very important to us. Hey, drink the bus. Here, take the cup. Hey, take the cup. Please remain stationary. A service bot will be here to assist you momentarily. Stewards! Hello? Please remain Help. stationary. Uh, a service bot will be here to assist you, you momentarily. What's that? What's going on? Uh, John. Eva? Uh, no. John. All right, so here's the question for you. After we've watched that and we've gone through all that, how does or doesn't this symbolize what could become of everyday Christianity. So I want you to take all the stuff we talked about with AI, this little clip of Mwali, and I want you to think about what is the symbolism that we should take away when it comes to our faith? What should we be aware of? What, should we, what are our temptations? Talk to somebody next to you. Tell them your thoughts. What does this symbolize about what could become of everyday Christianity? Think about it, answer it. How could this become our faith if we aren't careful? All right, now, just as a primer, just as a little bit of a primer, uh, we're gonna be talking tonight about training your faith. And the reason I wanted to show all this to you is because a lot of us don't know what it means to train our faith. We hope that other people will do the work for us. We maybe come here or on a Sunday hoping that it's gonna be the perfect service, it's gonna speak to you perfectly, it's gonna be the perfect worship songs, it's gonna be the perfect message, you're gonna have the perfect small group, you're gonna have the perfect high five moment with your friends, and, and everything's just gonna be done for you. Uh, and then what happens is a lot of you graduate high school and you don't quite know what to do with your faith because now a lot of things have changed and you aren't in those circles anymore and you don't know what to do with your faith. Some of you are already experiencing that when you have a rough day and you're like, man, it's not, I'm not in my youth group circle. Like, I don't know what to do. And so we have to think about what it looks like for us to be on the front end of this. There's a great scripture we're gonna be kind of spending time in tonight. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter nine. I'm just gonna read it to you. It says, don't you realize that in a race, everyone runs, but only one person gets the prize. So run to win. 
All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. So if you're writing notes, I've got a few things to start you out with. The first is what we, what we see right here is to pursue the prize, to pursue the prize. Write that down, the word prize. And I want you to think about what prize might mean when it comes to your faith. What might this passage be telling us to do? Back in the century that this was written in originally, and this has application for everybody, but back in the original century this was written in, there was a, a lot of competitions. There were a lot of competitions like the Olympic Games and all the types of things maybe you've heard about and are still around today. There was a particular competition called the Isthmian Games. The Isthmian Games. Try to say that. The Isthmian Games. Yeah, the Isthmian Games. And so uh, basically what would happen is everything would shut down. Like if, if countries were at war, they would stop being at war to go watch these games. They'd still like not like each other. But then they, after that was over, then they'd go back to being at war together. Like these games were huge. There were chariot races. There was, there was fighting. There was running. There was all kinds of stuff. And so basically the idea was when you're competing in these games, it's such a big deal. Everybody's watching. The idea was run to win. So when, when we just read in the scriptures here, when it says, so run to win, that's kind of the idea. You didn't want to compete in these games and just sort of like try your way through it. You would train for it. You would work for it. So when the scriptures say run to win, they're calling on something else. Now, what you may not know is what they would actually win was exactly what is described here in the passage. It was a prize, it was a trophy that would fade away. It was literally a crown of celery. Let's just let this sink in for a second. How many of you, how many of you like have celery around your house? Okay, it's got like a little shelf life, right? Like there's, there's days where it's like, mm, this is celery. And then you look at it and you're like, I think it's moving. Like there's, there's a little scary celery there. So they would literally compete for a crown of celery that in a matter of just a couple of days would get bad and ugly. Like imagine it was like on a sweaty dude's head. And after like a while, like why would you want that? But Because you couldn't display it. You couldn't back in the day like, like, you know, laminate it. So they would literally, like they would spend all this effort for a prize that didn't last. Okay, let's just let that soak in for a second. Again, it says, all athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. So a prize that fades away. Again, a prize that fades away. Let's take a good picture at celery here. Celery fades away. If mom was to put that in your lunch, if you were to have that served at your table for dinner, you might be like, ew, I don't think so. But this is exactly what they would do. I want you to think about the difference between a prize that fades away and a prize that lasts. So, a couple questions. What are you in your life, what are you in your life running toward? That's one of your notes right there. What are you running toward? What are you pursuing? And then secondly, what tends to be your crown of celery? What tends to be your crown of celery? You think it's important, and to you it is important, but is it really important? So I'm going to give you a couple examples here. Uh, a lot of you, and I'm not going to, don't raise your hand on this, by the way, because this could get embarrassing, but a lot of you really like streaks, doing things in an app that give you streaks, and streaks seem like a really, really big deal. I've heard some of you brag about how many streaks you have in your Bible app. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. I think that's great. But here's what's interesting. Is some of you have said things like, you know, I have a 200-day streak in my Bible app. Okay. But you also went on the winter retreat where you weren't supposed to have your phone with you. So how did that happen? Just saying. Maybe you gave it to your mom. I'll just believe the best. Maybe you gave it to your mom. But maybe you didn't. So... There's, a, there's something about competing for a crown that lasts versus something that you think is a crown. Just saying. 
Uh, sometimes we get really upset if our daily whatever, our daily habit, or checking in on a game, checking in on a on a you know a TV show, whatever the case would be. Like we get really upset when like Netflix releases whatever the latest show is, and we all we're like, oh, don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell me. So what do we do? We like spend all day binge watching because we want to see it all in one setting. We don't even think about if we should. We just do it. We compete for a crown of celery that fades. So I'm curious, what tends to be your crown of celery? What is something that if it doesn't happen the way you want it to, you freak out? And it could be anything. It could be really good things. It could be church. When church isn't the way you want it to, you could easily freak out about it. When your friend group isn't behaving the way you want them to behave, you can easily freak out about it. What tends to be a prize that you think is worth pursuing but maybe it isn't. When that special guy or girl doesn't return your glance the way you gave them a glance, what tends to be your crown of celery? So whatever the true prize is, which we haven't covered yet, it says to pursue the prize by training. Pursue the prize by training. Some of you are familiar with different athletes. Uh, maybe this is a name that's a little older to some of you, but maybe you know it. He is a swimmer. His name is Michael Phelps. Has anybody ever heard of Michael Phelps? Okay, he also sells Subway sandwiches, apparently. So, Michael Phelps won crazy gold medals when he swam. I mean, he just broke records and records and records and records. And so, uh, Michael Phelps didn't just jump in the pool and try to win. Michael Phelps trained. And the difference between training and trying may seem like not a lot, but it's actually huge. This is what he did. He swam every day for six hours. He lifted weights three days a week. He stretched his muscles. He just stretched his muscles for three hours a week. He ate 12,000 calories a day because he could burn it off with all of this exercise. And he slept in what was called an altitude chamber. What this would do is it would make it feel like he was at the top of a mountain, so he would have to learn to breathe stronger breaths on a daily basis when he went to bed. So he would breathe better and more effectively in the water. Interesting. This is what he said. Michael Phelps said this. He said, I want to be able to look back and say, I've done everything I can and I was successful. I don't want to look back and say, I shouldn't have done this or that. So he was willing to abandon things that took him away from his goal, take on things that would further him toward his goal. And he did all of that for swimming and he did that for medals, which one day will mean nothing. They mean a lot now. They're kind of cool. But one day when Michael Phelps is dead, those medals won't mean anything to him because he will be dead. They are kind of cool on this side of heaven. They're kind of cool to show to other people. And obviously we're talking about him, so he's made it in for himself. I'm not trying to dismiss any of his achievements. But what I'm saying is it was a prize that even though it's lasted, it still won't last. It's eventually gonna mean nothing. This is what... The Apostle Paul was saying when he said, so I run with purpose in every step. I am not just shadow boxing. I discipline my body like an athlete, training it to do what it should. Otherwise, I fear that after preaching to others, I myself might be disqualified. He's saying, God has called me to do so, so many important things that I want to, I want to even put my, like, I don't want to just say, well, all the preaching's important. He's like, I want to even put my, my body into a spiritual place. I want to look at what I do physically as a spiritual thing, how I spend my time as a spiritual thing. It's not just there's this spiritual part of my life and then the physical and the emotional, all this other stuff. There is a spiritual part of my life that impacts every part of my life, that everything is spiritual in my life. You see, if we believe that faith is something that is worth pursuing, then we are to pursue it wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly. Tell somebody next to you what you think wholeheartedly means. Don't just say wholeheartedly. Tell somebody next to you what wholeheartedly means. Like, give it a couple words. What does it mean? What does wholeheartedly mean? Okay. Let me hear some thoughts. What does wholeheartedly mean? Somebody. Yeah, what does it mean? To love something with your whole heart. What else does it mean? What's that? To say it with meaning. What else does wholeheartedly mean? Yeah. 
I love that. Put your whole self, put your back into it. What else do you think? Yep. Your whole body, your whole mind. Yep, what do you think? Everything you got, all in, 100%. 100%, yes. Okay, got it. Thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. So Ben wholeheartedly gave you that answer but didn't want to say it out loud. Got it, okay, that's great. All right, let me give you one last quick thought and then I'm gonna share something else with you but not me. So training, listen to this, training is meant to be applied. We do this by joining God in whatever he is doing. If you do training for the sake of just going like, hey, I did it, you're missing the point of training. Uh, one of my favorite movies, uh, like superhero movies, is a movie called Batman Begins. I don't know if anybody's seen it. It's a super cool movie. And there's this really cool moment when Bruce Wayne is knocked down and he can't get up because he has, he has this big log on, on top of him. And his butler, Alfred, basically says, what good are all those push-ups, Mr. Wayne, if you can't lift a piece of wood? You know, I'm like, yes, exactly. And then he finds the gumption to pick it up. So I think that for a lot of us, these moments being here, having these times with God, great. The fact that you might be taking notes right now, great. But training, everything you're writing right now is meant to be applied. So I'm gonna let uh, somebody else come on up here and share a little bit more. Amy's coming on up. Let's welcome Amy Steinbach, everybody. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I'm Amy. So tonight, I'm gonna share a little bit of my story about how I applied my relationship with God to be bold and sensitive, or excuse me, to be bold yet sensitive while I was following God's call. So I was raised in the Catholic Church. I believed in God, I prayed, I went to church every Sunday, but you know, I didn't really have a relationship with God until I was like 24 or 25. I really wanted to know God's will for my life, but I was really feeling kind of lost. And I started dating this guy, and if you went to winter camp, yes, that's the God. Uh, but anyway, the reason I bring it up is because I started going to his church, and his church was very similar to Riverside, but it was really different from what I was used to. But it was there that I started to develop my relationship with God. And, um, you know, I, I learned to read my Bible. Uh, the pastor there was doing this all-church journey of sorts, and I was so hungry for God. I was reading my Bible. I was memorizing scripture. I was doing everything I could to absorb as much as I could because I wanted to know what does God want for me in my life, right? So I also, um, in addition to learning from this all-church journey that we were doing and digging into the Bible, I also learned from the wise counsel of some, some Christian leaders at this church. And one of the ladies that I spoke to when I asked her if she had some advice for me, she said, you know, you just need to be bold and sensitive. So you wanna be sensitive to the promptings of the Holy Spirit and then bold to step out of your comfort zone and act on those promptings. She said that if I would be willing to listen carefully and follow the direction that God was putting me in, right? That he would do amazing things through me. Um, this was my training, okay? So like Pastor Tony was saying earlier, training is meant to be applied, and we do this by joining God in whatever he was doing. So let me tell you what I did. So part of my training, so I was thinking about this and wondering what does it mean to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit? How do you know when the Holy Spirit is speaking to you? So Isaiah 30, 21 says, your own ears will hear him. Right behind you, a voice will say, this is the way you should go, whether to the right or to the left. In my experience, that still small voice comes with this tugging on my heart, this unquiet or this unrest in my soul. It's a pressure to act to further God's mission. I can ignore it and eventually it'll go away, but when I've acted on it, God has done amazing things, guys. Following that nudge, though, can be really stressful. It can be really hard because you have to put yourself outside your comfort zone. And I've been stretched in ways I never thought I would be. Uh, I, I, you know, have lacked confidence. I've had anxiety. And honestly, I still struggle with some of that stuff today. But God has helped me grow through that. So let me let you in on a little secret. Sorry, my mouth is really dry. Um, in life, it is best to be comfortable being uncomfortable, and I know that sounds like an oxymoron, right? How can you be comfortable being uncomfortable? But the more uncomfortable situations you put yourself in, if you can get yourself used to doing that, that's when you grow, that's when God uses you because you need to rely on him, right? So here's the thing, God doesn't want to leave you to fumble through on your own, right? I'd say it's pretty normal to be nervous, 
and want to stay in your safe space. Uh, but uh, when you feel that nudge, remember Joshua 1.9, which says, this is my command, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Did you catch that? God will be with you wherever you go. He's always there. So don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, and just step out of your comfort zone, do it. So here I was, 25 years old. I'm sorry, I'm really struggling here. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're the best. Mm. Yes, the Fiji water's good. Thanks for asking. All right, so here I was, 25 years old, and all of this deep dive searching for God actually landed me in Mexico, of all places, where I was doing a discipleship training school with Youth with a Mission. So that's like three months of intense Bible study, and then we did this amazing missionary adventure where we traveled all over the country of Mexico, serving everywhere we went. And one day, we arrived in a small village. Yeah, good water. <laughs> we arrived in a small village where we met a 17-year-old named Raul. Now, Raul had a hernia, and I don't know if you know what a hernia is. It's basically where your stuff that's supposed to stay on the inside starts to try to poke out. It's like a bulge. It's excruciatingly painful, right? So for Raul, it also immobilized him. He was unable to walk. He had to be carried from place to place, and he needed surgery, but his parents couldn't afford it. At this point, I sensed the Holy Spirit asking me to move, and I was nervous. I was, it was like this pressure on my soul, a whisper to walk over, share my story, pray for healing. Oh, that was a stretch outside of my comfort zone. I knew if I just let it go, eventually it would go away, we'd move on, our team would go to someplace else, but I also knew that God was up to something, and he was asking me to be a part of it, right? And honestly, I was so nervous. But when God puts something on your heart for you to do, he doesn't leave you to fend for yourself or act in your own power. He doesn't mean for you to be afraid. He wants to work with you and through you, right? He's inviting you to be a part of what he is doing on earth, and that is really cool. So I knew God was with me. I decided to apply my training and act boldly. And I went across the room, and I knelt down next to Raul, I told him my story about how God had healed me when I was in high school and um, so that I didn't have to have surgery. And I knew, you know, that God, I knew firsthand that God is a miracle worker. And I wanted him to know that, right? Um, I know that nothing's impossible for God. I firmly believe that if Raul accepted that God could heal him, that he would. And I believed wholeheartedly that God not only wanted to heal him, but that he was going to. The group prayed over him as well. And it was kind of anticlimactic, actually, because nothing, nothing happened. The next day, I was um, still feeling this pressure to act. So we're walking along the beach with my team, and I was like, you guys, we need to go back and talk to Raul again. God's not done working in his life. So we went back to his house, and he was sitting in a chair outside his house, and two of my teammates went and started talking to him while the rest of us were kind of milling around talking to the rest of his family. Eventually, they called us all over, and we prayed for him. But this time, we prayed for his heart to be changed, not just his body. Um, and, um, excuse me, that day, Raul became a follower of Jesus, okay? So that was not the, ex the outcome I was expecting, right? But his soul was healed. And that was really cool. We left with joy in our hearts that day because we knew that Raul's life and his eternity had been changed. Okay, sorry. So the next day was Christmas Eve and Raul's village annually would have this um, soccer competition with a neighboring village. And we decided, well, hey, it's Christmas Eve. We're a long way from home. Let's go check it out. So we were there watching the, the soccer game, and you'll never guess who we saw. We saw Raul. But he wasn't sitting on the sidelines. He was actually running up and down the, the field completely uninhibited. You would never, ever know that the day before he was practically immobile. God had healed his body, okay? He was physically healed. So the day before, 
something else happened after we left because his soul was healed and then he was physically healed. That was the outcome that I was expecting. And what I want you to know, guys, is that what God is doing in you isn't necessarily just for you. So he's doing stuff in you and that's gonna help you grow and that's gonna make your life better, right? It's gonna challenge you, it's gonna stretch you, but the stuff that he's doing in you isn't necessarily for you. It could be for your neighbor, it could be for your best friend, it could be for somebody in a different country. So this training that we're doing, it's meant to be applied. So we don't wanna just you know, read about it, we don't wanna just hear other people's stories about it. We wanna go boldly and do. We wanna do this by joining God in whatever he's doing. So I encourage you all to just be bold and sensitive. Thanks. So let's, let's put all this together. We talked about AI taking over the world. Don't, don't be afraid of it, by the way. It just, it, just, it just reminds us that we can become very passive and not do our work in the coming years. But we can. We can still flip that and do other things. We can tend to assume that faith, by the way, is a fan thing. Faith is a fan thing. You know, uh, where you just watch it and you spectate it and you wait for it to impress you and you wait for things to happen around you that give you touchy-feely spiritual moments. We can begin to assume that faith is a fan thing. We can also begin to assume that when it comes to our prize, that our prize is heaven. Heaven's an amazing thing. And I love Amy's story because here she is praying for physical healing for this boy when what he really needed was spiritual healing. And for a lot of us, we can begin to assume that, well, I guess in being a Christian, the ultimate is that when I die, I go to heaven. Heaven is thrown in. It's a great thing, but it's thrown in if you say yes to Jesus. And you guys know that. That is the answer. That's the only answer, really, that matters. You can say yes to Jesus. You see, heaven and, like, fan stuff can become our crown of celery, all of these other things can become the thing that we pursue. Like, I can't wait until I die and I go to heaven. Then I can leave behind all these problems. I can't wait until, like, God gives me the next cool spiritual moment. And so we begin to pursue these things as if these are the end goals. Again, these are just the things that God throws in for us. He will, if you pursue him, occasionally give you those touchy-feely moments. He will, if you follow him, give you the gift of heaven with him. But it's because you have chosen him. I want you to think about the difference. What is the difference between pursuing something versus pursuing someone. As you think about the difference between these two, just think about it. What is the difference between pursuing something versus someone? For example, I'm a married man. I could say that twice a week I'm supposed to take my wife out on a date. I take her on the date. I say, that was great, wasn't it? See you later. And I leave her. But like that, all I've done is do the activity versus on the date, pursuing her, you spending time with her, asking her questions. What's going on in your life lately? How can I support you? What can I do as your husband to bless you? Like that's pursuing someone. We can begin to pursue our faith as a thing instead of pursuing Jesus through our faith. So if you put all this together, you have three choices. Again, you could pursue the feeling of heaven, and a lot of us would pursue that. You can pursue heaven, that's, that's, again, really cool. Or really, the best option here is to pursue the person who offers us heaven, to pursue Jesus, who is already pursuing you, who offers you heaven. It is what we would call the difference between trying versus training, trying versus training. A lot, I'll just use the analogy again of marriage. A lot of people, when they get married, try to have a good marriage, but not every husband and wife train to have a good marriage. And by training, I mean they go through premarital counseling. They continue to grow after they're married. They, they do hard work on themselves, so they continue to be a blessing to their spouse. A lot of people try to be good friends, but not every person trains for it. Not every person says, okay, how have I been a bad friend to my friends? And what do I need to own and apologize for? And how have I said you're the problem when maybe I might be the problem? So we have to train. We can't just try our way through life on the things that we say matter. So to sum it all up, you can either try your 100% or you can supply your 100%. You can, you can say like, well, I'm just gonna try to be a good Christian or you can say, how can I bring all of who I am for all of who God is? You know, earlier we sang some songs that have worship opportunities in them and, and we call that time worship and, and I'm not gonna you know, pick at words here. We call that time worship, and it is. It's an opportunity to worship. But for a lot of us, instead of worshiping God, we sing songs. You see, worship is not 
the song time, it is using whatever time is in front of you to give all of who you are for all of who God is. That's what I would define worship as. Worship is all of who I am for all of who God is because God gave all of who he is for all of who I am. And if, and if I can get that right, then anything I do can be an act of worship. When I, when I write um, out money for the church, when I spend my time with my neighbor, when I decide I'm gonna slow down instead of go fast or go fast instead of slow down, anything I do can be an act of worship. So you begin by saying yes to Jesus. Many of you have taken that step, and if you haven't, that would be your next step, to say yes to Jesus. But I also wanna give you a step to take after that, and I wanna show you what these steps are because I believe that every one of us has a step to take. And like any kind of training, if you're gonna go to the gym, they're gonna say, well, if you're a beginner, you might wanna start here. If you're kind of intermediate, you might wanna go here, and if you're advanced, you might wanna go here. So I'm gonna give you three opportunities to choose from. If you're a beginner to faith, doesn't mean if you've been doing this a long time, if you're a beginner to faith, maybe one of your next steps is memorizing a Bible verse. And there are lots of great ways to find one that you could memorize. I, I have found in my life when I'm struggling with something, I find a verse in the Bible that speaks to that and I memorize that. One of the first things that I struggled with when I became a Christian was I swore a lot. I had a really bad, I had bad language. I had, bad, like, I had a quick uh, sense of bad humor. And so I memorized Bible passages like in James where it says, anyone who considers himself religious but cannot keep a tight ring on his tongue, his religion is worthless. I memorized Ephesians 4.29 which says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. I memorized that when I was 16 and I still know it today because I decided to train. You can find something that speaks to you if you're willing to train on it. So memorize the Bible verse. Intermediate would be memorize a Bible verse and then take a journal or a notebook out and begin to write your takeaways out three times over the course of a week where you say, okay, God, I'm memorizing this verse and I'm willing to process what I'm taking away. And then the third would be to do those first two things, but then share your takeaways with someone else so you could invite them to take a next step. Basically being like a next step friend to say, here's my next steps that I'm taking and I wanna share it with you. So at the bottom of your notes, you have, a, you have a spot to check a box, and I would encourage you to decide which of those boxes you're willing to check. Now, maybe you're not willing to check any, and that's up to you. But maybe you're willing to say, I will start somewhere. So wherever you're willing to start, tonight in small group, I would encourage you, talk to your small group leader, and just say, hey, this is where I'm at. And small group leaders, remember to ask this question. You know, did anybody take a challenge tonight? Who's doing the beginner step? Who's doing the intermediate? And then talk about as a small group, you guys can encourage each other. Also, if you've not said yes to Jesus, that is the first step. And so as we close our time together tonight, I wanna pray for any of the steps that you're willing to take, and I wanna invite you to make this time valuable by not distracting anybody around you. So would you bow your heads, and would you just for a moment just train your heart to spend some time with God? Let's do that as we close and as we pray. God, whatever you've shown us tonight, we wanna respond. And we want to respond not by just doing more, but by pursuing you. So right now, Lord, thank you for pursuing us. Thank you for loving us first. And for anybody here tonight who wants to respond by saying yes to you, just in their heart, just hear their hearts as they cry out to you and say yes. As they say yes to you for the first time. Jesus, thank you so much for hearing us. And we invite you, Lord, to help us to grow into our next step with you. And for anybody tonight who has recognized a beginner step, an intermediate step, or an advanced step, may we get to know you better through these steps, not just do more, but get to know you better. God, for all of these things, we pray that we grow and that we can see our friends and our family come to know you more through what you're doing in our lives. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're gonna invite you guys to uh, head out to your groups, uh, and we ask that you make the most of your group time. So we're gonna let our sixth graders head on out first. After, hang on, sixth graders, sixth graders, after you check under your chairs for any garbage. No, gentlemen, gentlemen, go check your chairs for any garbage. Go check your chairs for any garbage. Ladies, same thing, check your chairs for any garbage.
And then likewise, seventh graders, check under your chairs for anything. Seventh graders, check under your chairs for anything. I guess everybody can do that right now. Just check under your chairs for any garbage. And then you guys can head on out too. By the way, remember, baptism is coming up. We would love for you to respond tonight through our form if you're interested. Eighth graders, you may head on out. Eighth graders, you may head on out. Ninth graders, go for it. Ninth graders. <laughs> Tenth graders, you may go as well. Thank you for waiting. And then 11th graders, slide on out. You're doing co-ed group tonight, 11th graders. So join downstairs in the family room downstairs. Co-ed group. And then 12th graders, move on up. Come on up, move on up. I will be right back, 12th graders. <laughs> 